Hello everybody, uh, well reInvent 2021 is still going on in Vegas. I think around about now it's party time in Vegas and they're all partying it up at replay. But for some of us who aren't able to be there, well we can't be there, but reInvent for me is all about meeting people and connecting in with the community. That's why I go to reInvent and so I'm doing that in my town. And I was really grateful to find Brooke who is a community builder for AWS in Brisbane, my hometown. Hey Brooke. Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me. I would add that it's not just that people are partying after reInvent now, they're probably all starting to get sick. <laughs> um, not with the panini, but with probably any other thing that they've come down with from partying too hard. So thoughts for everyone currently struggling if you're watching this. The fatigue, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, so Brooke, um, this is the first time we've met. No. Like we've had like literally two minutes before I turn the camera on. But um, yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you. I like walking down the corridors at reInvent, bumping into people. And so this is what we've done, virtually, real, really kind of virtually speaking. Yeah. So um, how's reInvent been for you on this side of the world? Yeah, very chaotic. Um, I am no stranger to bad times over differences. I was actually supposed to move to America in April 2020. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, so I worked for most of 2020 um, in both Brisbane and New York time zones, which are about 14 hours difference. So I knew ahead of time that I wouldn't be able to do that this week because I had so much of my actual normal day job um, to do. So I'm head of enablement for AI, machine learning and data at Blackbook AI, which is an AWS partner as well. Um, so doing that all around everything constantly jealous not only of everyone having a wonderful time at reInvent, but all of the time that they had to actually dedicate to watching things. I think I'll be catching up for about a month after this. At this yes, time. yeah. Well, so for me, going to reInvent, I mean, I've, I've said this before, and I don't think this is a secret. I've never been to a reInvent session, any of the reInvents I've been to. Have you been to a reInvent? I have not been to any reInvent oh, sessions yeah. or any reInvents. Right, um, okay. But yeah. Yeah, so I, well, having been there, I've not been to any sessions either. I mean, just catch up with them afterwards online, on demand, even pre-COVID times. But it is about the people. And um, yeah, no, so obviously, hopefully next year, we can both be there yeah. and um, connecting in with those people. So um, machine learning, as you said, so we both sort of share that common interest in machine learning. Yeah. Um, anything in particular that sort of caught your eye in relation to machine learning at reInvent this year? Um, Lots of different applications of things. I work in very applied AI stances. So although I studied pure maths at uni, but now it's very, very applied. So how does this connect to industry? And I think as part of the maturity of lots of the services, the way they're tying in with different things is really good. So for example, the chatbot builder for mm -hmm. Connect, um, Connect, yeah. which is my third favorite AWS product. <laughs> so now being able to use those cold transcripts to make a chatbot, because I don't know, you could always make transcripts and you could always make a chatbot, but for many organizations that leap was just too hard. So that's really cool. Um, and even things like Amplify, the front end tools, mm -hmm. not a front end developer, but I know a lot about Figma. So I can see that getting used at scale in really large organizations as well. That, that seems to me almost like a bit of a theme at reInvent was wrapping easier tools on top of existing services. Yeah. So making, lowering the barrier to entry for a whole bunch of things in tech. Yeah, it's a different view of accessibility. So obviously accessibility for actual accessibility is really important, but I think as the underlying tools are getting more mature, people are now able to ask those applied questions about how does this actually fit in with what we're doing or how can I actually use this? Because especially for pretty much all of the, the AI and machine learning services, they're very good backend tools, but it's not as tangible as something you can just work out yourself. So I think having friendlier front ends for things um, is a really good trend to see happening. Um, and that's something that I'm hoping will continue as everything continues to just mature. And I imagine lots of the serverless aspects of things mm. will help because that's a really big maturity step as well. So I think, yeah, especially next year after that, it'll be even. Sure. A couple of things that from what you just said there that sort of tie directly into announcements. So um, different front ends on complicated tools. So Canvas. Um, yeah. Canvas is, I think, as we've discovered on live streams on this channel before as well, live, uh, Canvas is a different front end onto SageMaker Studio. Like, it is the same tool. Um, that's great because it really does sort of 
drop that barrier to entry, makes it possible for someone who's not a machine learning centric person, but is a domain expert in data, I would imagine you'd need to know what the data is you're looking at, yeah. but can make it easier for you to train models. Yeah, and I always talk about context, and I think that's the most important part of applying machine learning to business things, is understanding all those contextual elements mm. um, and how it all fits together. Even, I think you can add automatically, I saw in Ali's part of the keynote about adding the holidays in, that's really good context that before people just wouldn't have thought of because it would have been too hard. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that part of Canvas is really good. Also, I was joking on Twitter, but um, the illustrations they have of the girl and the things, I like her outfits and yeah, I aspire right. to make, I don't know, hopefully that will be a side merch line of just, I can go in Halloween costume as the Canvas girl next year. This is the Etsy store that you're going to set up, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Manifesting right. it so that AWS sends me a jumpsuit so I can be like the Canvas girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> something else you mentioned just in that bit before as well was just the serverless bit. And they announced uh, serverless inference endpoints for SageMaker, but they almost said it as though it didn't really matter and they kind of just moved on. Yeah. Uh, that to me was really exciting. What is that something that you think you might end up using? You do a lot of. Um, the practical business side and actually seeing the rubber hit the road in terms of machine learning as well. So yeah. do you see a big use case for that? Yeah, definitely, especially when that ties into all of the sustainability objectives. Mm. I think as part of, I don't know, the serverless part is good for people actually using it, but when you look at how that underpins all of the other sustainability pieces of the reinvent puzzle, I think that's going to be really helpful as well. Just now people are really starting to strive for that more and it's getting reported on more at boards and companies with director level. So anything that enables that process alongside other technical maturity in the organization will really help them. Mm. Not machine learning, but, well, not directly machine learning, but another thing that was announced just very recently was the uh, sixth pillar of the well-architected framework, which is sustainability, which I just have to mention, obviously, because you just talked about sales and the sustainability effort there. Oh, I'm super excited about this, because yeah. the, the, the idea that there's now this wealth of information that um, will support businesses to actually have real tangible conversations about sustainability rather than just saying yes we think we're going to do the right thing in 20 years time there's something that people can actually do now yeah and i started i've been researching this heavily for the last six months or so and i started working out how i could manually calculate a lot of these things and then i saw that reinvent was coming up and i was just like crossing my fingers that because i knew i was like oh so i can get this from this and this from this and plug it together and then i was like hang on there's, there's going to be some sort of announcement. I saw there was a st sustainability guide for reInvent, and then I was just hoping, fingers crossed, that they would release the more mature features, and I got so much more than that with the well-architected pillar. So yeah. I think that's good because it will force people to think about it um, and take it into account. Mm. Even so, because even if they're not trying to improve things, you can't improve on something you don't understand the baseline of. So I think a huge piece of this will just be people understanding where they actually are sitting as a baseline because there's no coverage of that at so many different organizations. Yeah, we're really supporting that. And, and then the, the other part to that, just before, was it the day before, I think it was in Peter's keynote, was the, the dashboarding and the metrics around carbon emissions and all that kind of stuff. And that goes to your point as well, that, that, that just supports you. Um, I was just having a conversation just before I came here, and this will be up on the channel at some point as well, with uh, Luke Hargreaves, who was one of the principal architects behind actually putting together a lot of this stuff. And so, that was a really interesting conversation. Part of that was, um, I think it was my suggestion, and if it wasn't, I'm going to take it as my <laughs> suggestion, that um, we actually develop like a little open source widget that can go on companies' websites that can hook into those metrics so that they can just be, here we go, this is, this is how good or bad we are. That would be cool. Yeah. If, if you've ever used, like, and you go in Chrome Developer Tools and you can look at the Lighthouse audit, for I've not tried that. I, well, it's yeah. really good. So it gives you four different scores that are traffic lights colored as well as one to a hundred for um, performance and accessibility right. and SEO and things like that. But it's really good, very aside to this, but it's really good if you are running, for example, an e-commerce store and you want to see what your competitors' stores are like relative to yours in terms of performance, but it's just in Chrome Developer Tools and you can look at how everything's working. Nice. Um, and the idea that it sort of scores you on these different levels, um, something like that I think would be really cool just mm. because it not only gives a baseline for you and then you can map any improvements you have, but you can also then see how you're comparing to sure. others. And I think 
people are really fueled by competitiveness, um, even if they're not fueled by just being better for the planet. So I'll take whatever I can get sure. at this point. Whatever so. pushes it forward. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. All right. So so just before we started rolling here, um, we were just talking about reinvent what we took away from it. You have a you have a um, an additional thing that you think that people can sort of take away from reinvent. Yeah, yeah. So I do lots of speaking about speaking, which is incredibly funny when I say it like that. But um, <laughs> lots of things about how to present your data so it's persuasive, how to make your voice heard, just because as a young woman in tech, that's not always easy out of the gate. So I try to make it easier for other people. Um, and I mentioned this in my reinvent session guide, but I think it would be really helpful for anyone in tech. Once you've had your watch through of all the keynotes, the exciting time when you're excited about the new features, um, watch it again through the lens of a business person and see how they're making the point, see how they're communicating things, because it is an absolute masterclass in tech communication. Um, I don't know how big the teams are that are writing these talks, but it's not Swami writing his own machine learning keynote. There's going to be sure involved, but oh, probably there's quite a lot of other people. There yeah, would be yeah. a lot of people helping yeah. him with that. Um, and. Obviously, it would be fantastic if I had that every time I do a talk, but that's not the case. Um, so make note of how they're making points, even how they transition between uh, some of the business technical case studies and then the technical underpinnings of that. You won't get a better overview of that in action. So I think it's really valuable to you if you can really work out how that's actually happening and look at how they're communicating and even looking at what's on their slides and how they communicate their slides. Um, it's one thing to take that away from more business presentations, but they're presenting about AWS services, they're presenting about data, they're showing data visualization. Look at that and see what they've actually done and what stands out to you so that you can use that or take what you want from it next time you're doing a talk or next time you're presenting to the board. And I think it would just help so much to be able to communicate lots of this to business people, um, whether that's for if you're trying to sell them something or if you're wanting to be able to transition to one of these new services internally and you need buy-in, fantastic. There is someone that's showing you how to communicate that to a business audience mm. using benefits that will make sense to them. Um, so think about how you can use that communication piece. I like that a lot. I, I, I actually watched um, An Inconvenient Truth, which was many, many, many years ago now and strangely on topic still. Um, but that was one of the things that I sort of wanted to take away from that. Like I, I actually demonstrably changed my PowerPoint presentations because of watching that. And they did also have a massive team of people putting that presentation yeah. together. I think that worked from Apple. They had a big mm -hmm. keynote steep team working on it. Um, but just don't put loads and loads of bullet points in the presentations. But also, what, to your point, listen to the way they were talking and the actual, the way that they sliced up the message. Is that? Yeah. Um, you can transcribe them obviously in AWS transcribe or if you are lazy or efficient you can just in YouTube you can open up the transcript to the side and just copy paste it um, and even looking at different you can do text analytics on it I went through as a like a starting point I just count how many times they talk about various things um, so how they talk about how many times they bring up data or you can get a lot of sense of what's most popular overall in a talk if you're looking at different service names or when they come up. But then even if there is something in the transcript that you think is a really powerful way of communicating, you have that in the transcript so you can clip that out and put it in notes or something. Um, and it will just, it's a weird way to interact with content if you're not used to it, but it's really helpful in working out how you can level up from it. Just because if you try to watch a course about how to present technical content, there's no way they would be able to put everything in that was specific to AWS sure. that would make sense, but just approach it like that um, and then get more value out of it that way. I like that. So so go watch all the presentations that you want to watch and learn all about the services you want to watch, but then consider going back and looking about it again and sort of getting that extra layer of detail from it. I really yeah. like that. Especially as well, just as another side note, if there's ever any of the workshops or if they put any of the other ones on that are level 100, so it's normally the really basic level, go and watch those as well well as if it's through the lens of someone you manage um, or someone that's new to tech and then look at how they present those topics as well because then next time someone comes to you and says where do I get started with machine learning or something like that you'll understand the direction that they step through those points and how they sort of package things together and also where they stop I think when you get really mm. in deep with SageMaker and things like that it can be hard to <laughs> yes. um, look at what's actually included in a beginner's level so yeah I would say put your business hat on and then put your either entry-level developer or someone that you manage 
um, put their hat on as well and then rewatch some of the basic content. Try and remember what it was like for you when you first started. Really try, because like there yeah. was that day when someone said, I have a, I have a notebook. And you go, what What are you talking about? Yeah. And then, then everything from there started to unfold, but just try and put yourself back in the shoes of you before you knew any of that stuff. Yeah. And it's hard to do, it's hard to do. Or the first time you heard the word container. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Or yeah. serverless, or any of these things, absolutely. Yeah, so look at it through those lenses, because they honestly, the teams at AWS have been working on this for so long, um, and then the really big sprint to the end. So I think you'll get lots more out of it more broadly for your career than just the technical underpinnings. Excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah. So Brooke, if people want to find you and connect with you and do all the socially kinds of things, where should they go? Uh, it depends what you want. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. Um, so I have a Twitter that's just my name, Brooke Jamison. Um, that's mostly AWS tech content. I also post a lot on LinkedIn about um, any time I'm going to be speaking either in person or at virtual events. So lots of my speaking stuff's over on my LinkedIn. Um, I also started a TikTok. And if I talk about it here, that means I have to keep posting on it. Um, but my TikTok's all about how to transition into tech um, and getting a job with AWS or getting a job using AWS or just getting more into cloud for career purposes. So that's sort of, yeah, how they split up. Well, thank you very much, Brooke. I'm glad I bumped into you at reInvent, even though we're not actually there. Maybe. Fake reInvent. <laughs> uh, fake reInvent in a very, very quiet room compared to anything that you might find in Vegas. But thank you so much. Thanks. Maybe you'll find a jacket under the table or something. <laughs>